Welcome! In today's video, we are going to dive into the fascinating world of monopole antennas. Whether you are a beginner or looking to deepen your knowledge, you are in the right place. We will explore the key components that make up a monopole antenna and break down the essential concepts like impedance matching, current, voltage, electric fields, magnetic fields, electromagnetic waves, and wavelength. By the end of this video, you will not only understand how monopole antennas function, but also the significance of each element in ensuring optimal performance. Monopole antennas are very simple but effective. They were developed in the early 20th century around 1901. They were primarily used for maritime and military applications. Today we use monopole antennas for AM and FM radio, TV broadcasting, two-way maritime aviation, plus cellular communication, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. In our example here, on the left, I have a transmitter, and on the right, I have a monopole antenna. In order for you to get a full understanding of monopole antennas, we'll start with the output of the transmitter. Now at the transmitter's output, we have the transmitter's specifications. With the impedance of 50 ohms, the power of 900 watts, and the frequency of 900 megahertz. Now, we're going to start with the impedance, which is 50 ohms. The impedance of this transmitter has to match the impedance of the coaxial cable which we're going to connect to this output. And the impedance of the antenna where we're going to connect the coaxial cable also has to be 50 ohms. This is important in order to have maximum power transfer to the antenna. What this means is that this 900 watts of power for all of it to be transferred from the transmitter to the antenna and radiated out into the air for receivers to pick up the the transmitted output the coaxial cable and the antenna all gotta have the same impedance of 50 ohms now if this is not the case we're gonna have something called an impedance mismatch and so all the power would not be radiated out to the ear and any power that's not radiated out would be reflected back into the cable and this could damage the cable and it could also damage the transmitter so it's very important to have impedance matching between the transmitter's output the coaxial cable and the antenna so first we're going to look at how to choose the correct coaxial cable of 50 ohms between the transmitter and the antenna, bearing in mind that the length of the coaxial cable is 120 feet. So I went ahead and picked some coaxial cables with an impedance of 50 ohms. Now I could pick other cables too, like the RG6, which have an impedance of 75 ohms, but there's no point in doing that because all we need is 50 ohms. So I start here with the RG8, which have a power rating of between 1 and 5 kilowatts. The power we need is 900 watts, so this is fine. The impedance is 50 ohms, and we need 50 ohms, so this is fine. The frequency range is between DC and 3 gigahertz. What we need for frequency range is 900 megahertz, so this is also fine. The attenuation per 100 feet is 2.7 dB at 100 megahertz. Now our frequency is 900 megahertz, which is much higher than that. So we'll look at the second one, which is 6.6 .6 dB at 1 gigahertz. Now our frequency is 900 megahertz, so it should be a bit less than the 6.6 .6 dB. Um, but the distance here is 100 feet, right? Our distance is 120 feet, so we're going to have a bit more loss because the distance is greater. So I estimate that our loss here would be around probably between 7, 7.5 dB, which is fine. So when I look at the RG58, 
the power rating is too low. LMR 400, the power rating is fine, so is the impedance, the frequency range, and the attenuation. This is a really good cable with all the specs being much higher than the RG8. The LMR195, the power rating is also too low, and so is the LMR200, the power rating is also too low. So the only two cables we can choose is the RG8 or the LMR400. Now the LMR400 is probably going to be a bit more expensive because the specs are so much better. But the RG8 is fine for what we're doing. So I'm going to go ahead and pick the RG8. Now I went ahead and connect my RG8 coaxial cable from the transmitter to the monopole antenna. Now you'll notice here that I have one connection going to the ground plane and the other one going to the monopole antenna. So I have the middle conductor here in the coaxial cable going to the monopole antenna and the outer conductor going to the ground plane. I've heard from some viewers who have actually reversed this and I was told that it did work. However, even though it may work, you will not be getting maximum power transferred to your antenna and out to the airways. In this case, I'm sending 900 watts. If I should reverse this, it may still work, but it will not be as efficient. So I will not be transferring all of my power here to the antenna out to the airways. Some of that power would be reflected back. So it is very important to connect the middle conductor to the dipole antenna and the outer conductor to the ground plane. Now if you're talking about a dipole antenna, now this is different. With dipole antennas, both leads from the coaxial cable are connected to antennas that are identical. So you could reverse these leads. I have a video on dipole antennas in the description below. So if you like more information on dipole antennas, just check that one out. Okay. So back to monopole antennas. Um, it is very important to connect the middle conductor to the monopole antenna and the outer conductor to the ground plane. Now that we have our coaxial cable connected and we know that this coaxial cable has an impedance of 50 ohms along with the transmitter, so we have impedance matching between the transmitter's output and the coaxial cable. Now the next thing we need to do is adjust the height of this antenna so that it matches the impedance of the cable and the transmitter. So we need this antenna to have an impedance of 50 ohms. Now, but how do we do that? We have no way of knowing right now what height to adjust this to to match an impedance of 50 ohms. What we have to do first in order to find this information is to find the wavelength of 900 megahertz. And this antenna here is a quarter the wavelength. Uh, monopole antennas is quarter wavelength antennas. So we first got to find the wavelength, then we can find the height. So here, in order to find the wavelength, I have a very simple equation to do that. When I say equation, you most people usually, oh, I don't like math, but don't worry about it. This is a very simple equation, and it's gonna be really worth it for you to look at this and see how this is done. It's just gonna take one minute, and this will be very rewarding for you to actually know how to do this, okay? so. The wavelength is equal to speed of light over frequency. What is the speed of light? 300 million meters per second. And the frequency is 900 megahertz, right? The frequency we've been talking about, the frequency of our transmitter. And here, I have three times 10 to the eight. How did I get this? Well, I moved the decimal point from the end here back eight places just before the three. So I have three times 10 to the eight. That's the eight places back, okay? And 900 megahertz, I have here 900 times 10 to the six. 900 megahertz is 900 million. That's six zeros after 900. So I have 900 times 10 to the six, the six zeros I was talking about here, right? So. All I did here is to divide 3 by 900 and I got 
0.00333 times 10 to the 2. How did I get the 10 to the 2? I just subtract 8 minus 6. So I got 10 to the 2. So this is equal to 0 0.333 meters. The 10 to the 2 here, I just moved the decimal point two places to the right. So I got 0 0.333 meters, okay? And that's it. The wavelength of this 900 megahertz frequency is 0 0.333 meters. So we worked out in the equation that the antenna's length is equal to 0 0.333 meters. Like I said before, the height of a monopole antenna is a quarter the wavelength. So this is the wavelength. So what I did is to divide it by 4. So I got 0 0.0833 meters. So to make these numbers a bit smaller, easier to work with, I convert it to centimeters. So I move the decimal point two places to the right. So I have 8.33 centimeters. So I have that listed here. The height of the antenna is 8.33 centimeters. And for those of you who find it a bit easier to work with inches, that would be equal to 3.28 inches. All right. So the transmitter, the coaxial cable, and the antenna now have the same impedance. And this is necessary in order to have maximum power transfer. That's all 900 watts of your power from the transmitter would be sent through the coaxial cable onto the antenna and then radiated out onto the airways. So here we have our signal coming from the transmitter and going to the antenna. This is an alternating current. These are cycles of this particular frequency is 900 megahertz. So we have a 900 million of these every second going to the antenna. Now this signal alternates. So it goes from zero to a certain voltage, then back to zero, and then to negative, and then back to zero again, right? So this alternating current in here cause an electric field and also magnetic field to develop around the antenna. Now this electric field and magnetic field will be sent out into the airways and both the magnetic and electric field would join together and become an electromagnetic wave. But at this point here, uh, just this signal alone is not strong enough. You see part of the signal is going to ground as well. So that's what this ground plane is for, to stop the signal that's going from ground from being lost. Without the ground plane, it would go to ground and it would be lost. The ground plane reflects this signal back up to the field around the antenna. Now, this ground plane has to be at least the same as the antenna. This antenna here is 8.33 centimeters. This ground plane should be 8.33 centimeters in diameter, at least that. It could be more, but it can't be less. If it is less, what will happen? Some of the signal going towards ground would not be reflected off the ground plane because it's too narrow, so this signal will be lost. So the ground plane basically is just to reflect the magnetic and electric waves back up to the main body of the signal that is coming from the antenna. And all of the signal would be joined at this point and go out into the airways and become an electromagnetic wave. So with this reflection, the monopole antenna is actually behaving like a dipole antenna because as we know, the monopole antenna is a quarter wave antenna. So this pole here is a quarter wave as we talked about before. Now a dipole antenna has two quarter waves. Okay, so that's one half a wave total. With the monopole antenna only having a quarter wave, with this reflection back from the ground plane, the monopole antenna behaves like a dipole antenna. It behaves as if it has another quarter wave antenna just on the other side of this one, just underneath of it. 
so it is getting the full half a wave just like a dipole antenna. This is Trevor from Telecom Training. If this video has been helpful to you and you would like to see more videos like this one, please don't forget to like and subscribe.